Hi, this is Next Malin with Shell, and I am Shell, and today we are here with Alfonso Copia. He is a pilot for United. He has been a pilot for six years, and he also is an Italian. He lived in S Sicily and was raised in Sicily, and he aspired to be a pilot, and today we're going to talk about what inspired him and what has changed during this past year of the pandemic and how being a pilot is affording him a really nice lifestyle that he enjoys. And he did say it's not for everybody. So if you are an aspiring pilot, you may want to listen up. Um, and if you're just curious for entertainment, I'm glad you're here watching us. So Alfonso, you are in Japan. So I want to say, Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you've been on a week, or is this two weeks trip, uh, Japan well, and a few other places? This is a nine-day trip. Nine-day trip. We started from Los Angeles to Guam, then from Guam to here, then from here we gone to China once. Got to do one more time, then go to New York, and then come back to California. So it's a long trip. That's not usual. This is one of the effects of COVID in the, into the industry. We have switched from uh, flying passengers, so basically regular schedules every day kind of thing, so that your trips are much smaller because you go back and forth uh, to where now we're flying cargo and uh, you know the trip gets longer and longer because the flights are not every day. So you may do one flight and then you have to wait a few days to do the next flight and so on. So that's one of the major things that has changed for me in this year. So it doesn't apply to a lot of the pilots in the airline business. It's just been just for a small sector of the industry and a small group of pilots at United Airlines. Mm. The majority of the pilots have not flown much in, in the last year, year and a half because the schedule have been reduced to 30%, 40% of what they used to be. Yeah, that's quite a bit cut yeah. down. And you were telling me earlier before we talked before this interview about how um, your company made a decision to, uh, what did you say, uh, the furloughs? No, wait. Just about how, you, how basically, basically uh, you're, the pilots are still getting paid but they're at home a lot more. Yes, I was telling you before that uh, United was one of the first companies that together with the unions and the pilot group uh, came up with a plan to avoid forlowing or let go pilots. Uh, and the biggest thing was that, uh, of course, us as a group, as a pilot group we wanted to avoid our junior colleagues to be let go and the company wanted to keep the pilot in the property because it is very expensive to train pilots mm. to qualify them for a specific airplane and they fly and so once they let them go then it would have cost them a lot more money to get them back yeah and uh so the company basically gambled on us saying that uh they wanted to keep us on the profit as well because uh, so that they could be ready to rebound as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, granted, nobody knew how long this was going to last. And, you know, so since the first month, though, they saw more than 50% of the flying going away and then even further down to 70%. So we basically had a big majority of the pilots that – have no flight to flight and then based on the contract and everything that we have likely in place they still have to pay us mm -hmm. so because we are employees and so basically we have minimums that need to be met and if the company doesn't give you a minimum amount of flying you still get paid for it um you did so say though everyone's everyone's salary or monthly sal monthly paycheck 
got mm -hmm. lowered just a little bit so you could keep all the employees on the payroll. And then one of the strategies that we use and the United approved together with the unions and the pilot group voted for, because at the end of the day, the union is made by us, is we pass uh, this uh, agreement by which uh, the company was allowed to reduce our minimum guarantee that for paying us less if we didn't fly. But if we did fly, then we would stay at the pay that we were. So what happens is, just to be simple, is that people that flew domestic trips, they were cut by 70%, end up making a lot less money because they weren't flying. They were staying at home. Me, in, a, in the other side, just because I happened to be in the plane that was doing the cargo flying, and continue to fly even more than before, mm. well, I really never got affected by it. It was just okay. like, it just the time. And, and, and most of the things are seniority based in the airline. And I had just taken this position before all of this happened. And although there were people senior to me in other planes that did the domestic trips, there was their choice at that time to stay there. Before, you know, seems unfair, but it's just what happened. It could have been the reverse where the, you know, domestic people were flying and, and the international was going to be canceled completely, which is what it looked like at the beginning. If it wasn't for the cargo section, we as national pilots, we probably would have stayed on the ground mostly because our international is down maybe like 5%, 10% or what it used to be. Mm -hmm. without counting the cargo okay um so there's so no passengers on the planes that you're flying other than the workers there's just cargo that's correct that's correct yeah uh, i mean we do also have flying passengers in some countries okay it's uh, a, a very small number and are they all spread out on the plane they, as well yeah but it, it, not necessarily because there is any rules. United doesn't have the uh, rules where it puts people apart or has the middle seat open anymore. But it's just because there is no customers. There's, you know, people to Europe have to have a specific reason to go and to come back. Now you had to take a test to go and a test to come back. So there is really no leisure tra traveling and, and for liability purposes and reasons a lot of the business traveling is almost done to zero as well. So there is routes where we still have a lot of people, uh, maybe because uh, they don't believe in it or because they just have to travel no matter what. But for example, I've noticed that Israel, Tel Aviv is always full. Uh, Brazil is always, is always full. Or maybe because their community are so big that even if it's just a few of them, travel they still fill up the plane also because a lot of company have taken the service away so we are some of the few companies that continues to fly in a lot of places and uh are the only one that can guarantee people that have to go they can go mm -hmm. um but yes like our european flights maybe like 30 percent capacity right now okay i mean don't quote me no i don't see it yeah all, do some just of just what you observe, but, what you think. Yeah, it, throughout this year, throughout this year, though, I have one way chosen and tend to fly more of the cargo stuff because I had less exposure. I didn't have to deal with passenger flight attendants. It was just four pilots, and we went to, from place to place, mostly to empty airports. So it was less risky for me too. I mean, it was also a way how to manage risk. Because at the end of the day, we also, you know, had to be worried about it. And a lot of our pilots have suffered too. Some have died. Pilots and flight attendants. They've gotten the virus and died? Yeah, yeah absolutely. They have. Anyone you personally know? Uh, as a pilot, no. I heard the names and, you know, because they publish them sometimes. You know, they, you know. Uh, the company talks about it, but uh, no, I, I didn't know anybody personally. I flown with guys that had got it and got better, but uh, no.
No, I haven't. I have a I don't know anybody. friend that got it and got better as well. But then yeah. my friend's dad died of it, so it's affected. Yeah, I mean, a lot me. of people, but it's I'm kind of insulated. I mean, uh, the numbers are so high, but I don't know that many people that have had it. You know, so that's why there's this whole like, oh, it's a hoax, but it's not a hoax. I mean, no, I lost an uncle. One is still very sick. He. And if recovery is still very weak. Uh, I had two hands that had it, cousins that had it. In Italy, it was bad because they were in the north. So the one in the north, they got in the first wave and uh, did okay. And then in the second wave, one of my uncle got it in the south and he's the one that died. Oh, I'm so and sorry. His wife and the other hand that were in the house. I got it, got a little sick, but it got better. Mm. No, it's not a hoax. You get no, sick. It's not. When, you get, when you get sick, it's not good. Even for young people. It's not a fun thing to have. It's not like a it could be nothing. Because these, you know, the people that I've talked to that, that really have it, gone through it. Mm -hmm. You can have absolutely no symptoms. Like one of my cousins. Nothing. The only thing she didn't test the food for like a week. And then uh, in her husband had pneumonia and it was done for 15 days. He's a big six, five, you know, you know, football player looking guy. And he, it was done, you know, it is. It's he no, survived, but he was I down go. for several weeks. Yeah. A couple of weeks with, uh, you know, all kinds of antibiotics, steroids and things. And, and I think when he got it, they didn't even know that that oh, that's it was so it early was. because yeah. it was at the very beginning. Yeah. yeah. And they lived like in the initial red zone in Italy, in near Milan. And they didn't cut off the, um, the flights from Italy to America in the beginning, even though Italy had a very... Um, yeah. high rate of of this virus. Yeah, but so they did with China. No, me, you know, believe it or not, the Chinese plane has never left the airport in the States. They've always been coming. They continue to come right now. They don't quarantine. They don't do anything special. We cannot go there. Huh. We go there and we can't stay because for us to stay there, they want us to take a test to go, a test when we land, and then we are escorted by the police into a government hotel if we wanted to stay there. So we as a pilot group and the union together with the company have refused to do that. So what we do to, to keep the cargo flowing from China is to do what I'm doing now. I'm in Tokyo. We fly there overnight. We land, unload, reload, and leave. Okay. Instead of in landing. and out. Yeah. So... We don't, we don't lay over in China. We haven't lay over there for a long time. We tried a few times, and then we realized it just wasn't going to work. Nobody want to do Risk it. <laughs> to risk it, and then we didn't know if you actually did test positive, what would happen to you, and then we saw what would happen because some FedEx pilots got sent into some government facility that was akin to a jail more than a hospital or hotel and we were like no we're not going there i'm i wasn't gonna go they yeah. can't afford to go uh but we have similar situation in other country too that look a lot more civilized you know australia has been incredible both with crew foreigners and his own people there is still thousands and thousands of australians stranded around the world uh that they cannot go back home because to go back home, there is a restricted number per day of people that are allowed it in. Hmm. And uh, when they land, they had to pay the quarantine in the hotel, which is a few thousand per person. Oh, wow. And the government sends you wherever they want, whatever hotel they choose for you. <coughs> and... Uh, Flights are super expensive because there's so few people allowed on the plane that the tickets is very high. I've noticed Australia has very low rates of yeah, but the they virus. Have the they have it on a tight control it. then. Huge price for it. I mean, they've been basically isolated for a year. And they're just coming off of rain, uh, snow. 
fire. I mean, their whole country was on fire. fire. They had a huge amount of rain that destroyed that for Sydney. So fire, but rain, anyway, and then the yeah, virus. So, They've had a really rough couple years yeah. as a country. But, it, you know, they do well. They have good economy and whatnot. I mean, I, I love Sydney. It's my favorite layover. But Is for it? now, I'm not going because it takes mm -hmm. us three hours from when we land to when they actually give us a room in the hotel. Okay. which they choose and we're not even allowed to open the door hmm. of your room. they deliver food at the door like if you were in a jail wow. it's time for you to leave it's crazy I, i'm not doing it i try to avoid it as much as i can so what kind of testing do you have to do and because you have to test and quarantine and do these procedures that they're telling you to do. Um, is that one of the reasons why you're flying, you're gone for two weeks and you have a lot of different destinations because they've already tested you, you're already clear, you're already in the air going through the airports and the the planes. Is that why you're, no. you have no. a longer trip? No, 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 the longer trip I'm mostly due to the schedule so i mean it, it's not too complicated to explain but basically if you go to a destination where there is a flight every day most likely the crew only stays the minimum amount of time maybe 24 hours because one group brings the airplane the other one brings it out okay now if you go to a place where the uh flight is three times a week and then there will be people that had to stay there for three days and people that have to stay there for four days because one brings it, one leaves. And the one that get left behind has to wait for the other guy to come three days later, right? Okay. That's with passengers. With cargo, it's even more unregular than that. Mm. You know, he, because it's not necessarily schedule they come out the flights last minute when they have the cargo to move they build the trip so let's say they send me to guam last minute it's not necessarily true that there's going to be a flight waiting for me to come back so they will eventually build it when they have enough cargo to come back okay more or less i mean it's more organized than that but this is just like kind of a highlight to how it works Okay. It's almost like the people that fly private jets, right? They go yeah. to a place and they stay out because they have to wait until the owner wants to go back. Mm. So that is why the trips are lasting longer. Uh, for what concerns the testing and stuff, the truth is like now is getting more uh, where almost everybody wants you to test. So like right now we have to take uh, a swab to go for what I can remember. Uh, I think you froze up. We don't get off the planes, but Sydney, Sydney, you, you heard me? So I yeah. was listing all, listing all the places where we had to test. So in some places we test and quarantine, in some places we always had only have to quarantine, and in some places we are completely free. Okay. We are exempt as a crew members. So it all depends where you go. Okay. Like here in Japan, we don't test to get in. They do test everybody that comes in. But we are exempt as crew members, but we are supposed to stay inside the hotel ground. Not the room, but the ground of the hotel. So it's actually not too bad here because we can use the gym, we can, you know, go to the restaurants and things like that. Uh, when was the last time you were tested? Uh, actually, I have not been tested for flying on my own, or for work. They don't test you, huh? No test? They don't test you? No, but I avoided all this. No. It's not mandatory unless you go to a destination where the nation that is uh, receiving you wants to test.
the company cannot test everybody that goes to work every day. It's just, it's just not feasible. It's plus um, with the amount of false positives, it would be so impractical because when somebody tests positive on a trip, it creates an enormous amount of disruption because now all the crew that has been with you has to be quarantined. And the people that flown with you in the week before have to be in quarantine. And so what happens is like that people get stranded around the world. So it, it's not feasible for us to be tested every flight because the, we will bring the industry to a standstill. Okay. It just will work. But it, does everyone wear masks? And Yes. So we have protocols. We have to wear masks. And... Um, so for the passenger flights, we wear the mask uh, all the time that we are with public around or that the cockpit door is open. Uh, when we close the cockpit door, then we can talk to each other. And if we agree that both of us are comfortable taking it off, we take it off. Okay. And the reason is, is that we're going to be so close for so long that really the mask most likely won't change the situation if it has to happen. And it is kind of uncomfortable for us to do some of the mention, the things that we have to do, like talking on the radios and talking to each other, because the airplane has a lot of noises and it really is not practical to be staying with your mask on the whole time. And it's um, probably easier to communicate. You know, you can kind of read lips while you yeah, hear the exactly, audio. Exactly. It becomes very difficult to communicate. Uh, with, with the, the loud mask on. plane. And if you have the mask on and your voice is muffled, I would imagine it just doesn't it's work. hard. It just doesn't work. I had done it when uh, some colleagues have said, like, you know, I have, you know, you know, grandparents at home or I have a kid with a pre existing condition. So can you guys please keep it? And then we do it. But it is. Uh, Some of the flights the are long, so wearing things. those on, wearing those after a long period of time, it's like, ah, oh, can't wait to get this thing off. Yeah, we do if we had to, but this is how the the company protocol is. This. If you are in public, if you are next to the flight attendants, if the door is open, we had to wear. It. Uh, once the door is closed, uh, we talk to each other to see where we stand and go from there. Uh, all the pub public space, the flight planning area, the offices and everything like that, everybody's wearing the mask. Mm -hmm. And then the, the planes are disinfected. We have a lot of PPE on board. Uh, the company provides masks, gloves and uh, Clorox wipes. So every time we switch positions, we, uh, we have the equipment to clean up behind us and uh, that's what we do well what got you to become a pilot what what inspired you were you like a little boy playing with little airplanes and um, dreaming well it's been so long that it's almost too hard wait you're cutting out say it again it's i think the closest Thing that I can and so I always saw this airplane to be able to fly one of them. And then uh, between that and by the time I went to high school, there was also Top Gun, that movie that came out that I thought sounds hilarious. But then we as inspired generation and generation of pilots, mm -hmm. um, especially on my age group. A lot of the guys that went into the military and or went to the civilian aviation world, they do really got inspired by Top Gun and some other aviation movies. <laughs> like that. Have you driven down to San Diego uh, to but the no, house from Yeah, Top Gun? yes. And in fact, uh, I went to an aviation high school in Italy. And some of my friends have come to see me. That's all they want to do. They want to go find all the places where they shoot the movies. So I've seen them all because of them. Most like, I mean, I would have not gone. Probably I didn't even know about it, honestly. 
But this friend of mine once came and he had the whole list. <laughs> and and uh, we went down uh, uh, to Oceanside to see the house. And then we went down to San Diego to see the bar. And then he was so lucky too that when I show him uh, uh, the Hollywood Walk, uh-huh. you're not going to believe this. But there was Johnny Depp and Tom Cruise in front of leaders. So it was shocking. Like he got because <laughs> I never see anybody. I've been there a million times, but this guy came for once and he got what luck, that right? Kel Shaw, what luck, yeah. <laughs> this is what probably inspired me, but most importantly, I think I was always really attracted by the lifestyle. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about that lifestyle possibility of traveling, of meeting new people. Uh, cultures and you know coming from a humble family i am and i and turned out to be true i mean i've been in places that i would never imagine i would have been you know mm-hmm. uh, if i had to go on my own even if it was a good job even if i was well off and rich these places that i've been there is no way that you will go uh, in rural parts of China or Korea or Southeast Asia or, you know, it just don't come to mind to be able to go see the panda in Chengdu, China. Your home in Italy. And so, you know, if you, you know, pursue it and uh, end up to one of those positions where you fly internationally, uh, you really will live the lifestyle that I was looking for. Mm. It wasn't easy, but it happened. So how many countries have you been to? Have you been counting or is it just too many to count now? No, I, I don't know. A lot, a lot. 50? Probably, yeah. Probably 50. Yeah, I should count it. I have one of those maps where the, you can scratch have you yeah. seen them? They're really cool. This map you can put pins on, like the world map. And then uh, my mm-hmm. wife gave me this one where you can scratch uh, the little country and it changes color. Oh, so I've been there and you scratch it off? Correct. And Correct. Okay, and cool. There, there's a lot of color because it's all golden or, or silver. And then you scratch it out and you get the color of wherever nation. So we've been in a lot of places. But by myself and as a family, we traveled a lot. Yeah, and I know your wife. In fact, I've known her longer than I've known you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's and traveled a lot too. I it see the beautiful be pictures that you guys post on your Facebook. You alone sometimes, and you as a family. Yeah, and I'm just most jealous. likely when I'm alone is I'm at work, and when I'm with them, <laughs> yeah, it's when we're on vacation. Yeah. And and you guys get to go to Italy and visit your relatives quite often, right? Yeah, yeah. Basically, we go once, twice a year, minimum. And uh, last year they couldn't come because uh, this happened, and uh, Italy was only accepting Italian passports. Or perhaps they could have come as a family of an Italian citizen, but they would have had to quarantine. Mm. And I could got away because being a crew member, I had a spot where I could mark crew member and, and skip the quarantine. Mm. But normally um, she would have to wait. Her and your son would have to wait 14 days before flying and stay there 14 days? No. You, no, you or go and make it before you can start doing anything fun. Well, say that one more time because it cut out. So the way the rules were last year, but they change all the time and they have changed in the United States. I mean, so last year in the summer, if if you were allowed to go in, so you had to be a family of Italian citizens going to visit family, okay, or for business. There was no tourism allowed at that time. 
okay, the time that I went. When you go to your destination, if you're supposed to stay for more than 72 hours, you were supposed to quarantine for 14 days before starting doing wherever you wanted to do it. That okay. means that as soon as you go to Rome, from Rome you go to Sicily, and then you had to be home for 14 days. Okay. So I was able to bypass that because I'm a crew member. So crew member had an exemption in yeah. the law. Uh, like we still have it to this day. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen this year. But uh, yeah, things are yeah, rapidly changing week wrong. by week right now with the, the vaccines and the, the um, pandemic numbers going down. <laughs> Unfortunately, Europe is going back right now. Italy is in lockdown again. So is Germany and France. So things that go oh, backwards wow. there. Huh. I'm afraid that uh, uh, it will be next. Yeah, you think we're going to have another we lockdown? Can, may, maybe we can avoid this. If the vaccine kicks in fast enough, mm -hmm. otherwise we've always been like two weeks behind Italy and Europe, two, three weeks behind. So it's just unavoidable. It's just going to happen. And then the restrictions have been lifted and states have taken the mask off and just uh, doesn't make any sense because you can see what's happened to you in front of you. It's just happened to a different place. Yeah. But we have basically been the mirror of what happened there has happened to us. So I don't see why we think that we're so much different. Yeah, but we're all human beings. Case, in this case, we actually do have the advantage of being much farther ahead on the vaccination. So hopefully, I want to stay positive. Yeah. We don't have to go on a third wave. Uh, yeah. Maybe it could be a small one because mm -hmm. there's so, and so many people they already had it. That the numbers could stay a little bit better. Yeah. Although they do say that some people could get the get it twice, especially if they get one of the other right, variants, but it's very right? Minor. Mm -hmm. You know, this the percentage of that happen is so small. Uh that uh you know, it will not really affect the numbers per se you know in big numbers i took it super seriously right from the beginning because i watch a lot of youtube news mm -hmm. and i um subscribe to a canada news channel and an australia news channel because of course they speak english and i speak mm -hmm. english but they were reporting on what was going on in china and they were reporting on things um about how grave it was and how viral it was. And here in America, the message we were getting from our president and the people up, high up, they were acting like it was nothing, you know? The, oh, it's, it's, it'll come and it'll go. And I yeah. actually had a couple friends laughing at me. They're like, let's go have breakfast or let's go out and have drinks at this bar restaurant and i just in the end of january i was like nope i only do house visits and to people that take it seriously and and that's what i've been doing this past year i literally have just been i i have a ha small group of uh people that i'll go to their house watch movies and then i'll come home and that's my socializing you know i'm still taking it seriously so if we have a third shutdown i know there's going to be a lot of people that are upset however it's going to save lives i think i think we're not out of the woods yet mm -mm. yeah we'll see how fast this vaccine can be done and uh yeah i when this thing started or started to come out i had just come back from china at the end of jan no at the end of december and they were already new over there things were different there was less people in the streets already that early on and but uh i never any trip for a few weeks we were still going and things were shut down yet we were still going and uh 
started to hear that people were coming back from the holidays and were told by the Chinese not to go back to work. And that is when I knew, knowing China, that that was something big coming. I didn't need the news to tell me. I just need the news that the Chinese government is telling people not to work. And that was enough. Because that's, that's huge. They want their people working. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I knew that something was wrong then. And then, when, and then in February, for one of my things that I do every year, I go there for this, you know, celebration of a saint that we have in my town. And everybody was asking me, what do you think about it? What do you think about it? And I'm like, look, a hop, it doesn't come to nothing. But I think it's something big because I heard that the Chinese are not going back to work after New Year's Eve. Hmm. And sure enough, it was true. And uh, yeah, so it wasn't that hard to see. They just didn't want to see. Yeah, yeah. They gamble on maybe we're just going to wink it. And yeah. And we're okay with it. And it just didn't work out. Mm -mm. How many it. years do you think this is going to go on? Especially with the airlines. Do, do you see any loosening up? in in the near future for some of the restrictions uh, they have i'm not sure i'm not sure uh the other countries i know has a head on the vaccination profile as we we are or israel israel is 90 percent, but there are small country but other small country i guess uh they refuse to buy or they cannot afford to buy you know international vaccines or there is not enough for them so they're still waiting on their oh, own vaccine wow. You know, like even rich Korea, it, it, they haven't started to vaccinate very much because they're making their own vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I think they only have approved one of the foreign vaccines. I don't remember which one it is. Somebody was telling me about it. Hong Kong, same thing. They're using the Chinese one, but no, as fast as you would think they would. Uh, and they have Dragonian restrictions. Dragonians. I mean, like... If you get picked to be one of the contacts of somebody that tests positive, even if you test negative, they whisk you away in a government facility for 10 days, you and your kids, with no say. You're just going. Yeah. You, 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 know, you miss out on work. You, you eat what they give you. You sleep where they tell you to sleep. 10 days. Rich or poor, it doesn't make any difference. And uh, Taiwan has been really strict like this too with quarantines and stay home, but they had a better system where they put basically, uh, you know, like when you have house arrest. Well, and you had to stay in your house and they knew if you lived and did the same and things like that. So... Uh, I saw China some news studies. So they were welding people in their house, like they had. I would uh, be surprised. I mean, families was... in a in a in a big, like an apartment complex in America, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and they were welding the door shut so no one could leave or or. Now, I don't know about I don't know in. about that, but I know for a fact that this Shanghai airport had a few cases one day and they held 17,000 people inside the airport until they test everybody. Wow. 1,700 people? 17,000. 17,000? Yeah. They were all stuck in the airport until they were tested and had Two results? Mm-hmm. And then if you were tested positive, then they, boom, whisked you away almost like you're a prisoner and put you Correct. in some kind Correct. of almost like a detention center, but it was... They're not the detention court, center, the court, but I see the picture. They're like, they're not a hotel room either. It's closer to what a jail looks like to what a hotel looks like. Okay. So, Gosh. You know, yes. It could be like little prefab, little housing. I mean... So... My is, is that we have given up a lot of our 
rights and freedoms, especially in other countries, but a little bit is coming too. And when I say that, I'm not talking about the mask. The mask, where people complain so much about it, it's no freedom. There is no freedom behind wearing a mask. But other things, for example, giving up all your information every other minute to subscribe to get the vaccine or to get the test. So, you know, we don't notice that, but we have given our everything. I mean, I don't know how many times on Otina I had to log in to see if it was my turn for the vaccine and I had to register and put everything. Oh, wow. You know, and uh, how many times how the governments have asked me for all of that. And mm. because I land in this country, I land in that country. And the way they're done with their citizens, it could be easily learned by the West too. How easy it is to manipulate people to do whatever they want. I mean, at the end of the day, for these people in Hong Kong, to be whisked away for 10 days. It has, you know, it's a huge, huge loss of freedom. And you know, even positive. I mean, imagine Is that. it just because you have a high temperature then? No, because you were close contact with somebody that tests positive. Oh, they're doing, they're, wow, they're really strict. That's crazy. That's crazy. So I'm, I'm saying like, I just hope that, uh, you know, this huge bureaucracy that we have created to fight this very real problem mm -hmm. eventually will allow itself to go. Because the problem with bureaucracy in, in every field is that they thrive on getting bigger and bigger and they never give up power. So I'm worried that eventually we as citizens, we will have to wrestle the power away from that. Yeah. Because all of those people that are in charge now of directing and controlling somebody, yeah, they're not going to give it up that power very easily. There is a lot of people making a lot of money doing all of these things. Yeah. So information and, and you know, directed by government has to be taken with a grain of salt and we need to be smart citizens to do the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, so don't fight not to wear the mask. Mm -hmm. Fight if they're trying to whisk you away for 10 days. You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to choose our battles wisely yeah. at a certain point. But I hope not. I hope that, you know, you know, eventually with the vaccine, the numbers go down and, you know, governments would just go back to their normal business. Have, and have you gotten a vaccine already? Actually, no. But I finally scheduled mine for Monday. Oh, okay. Because uh, my group was up uh, since February, but I never got called. And then... Finally, now you can actually help yourself by scheduling yourself in different places other than just, uh, you know, that Hanheim Center, wherever it is that uh, the website directs you to. And uh, if you can certify that you're one of the group that is allowed to get it and you find an appointment, you can schedule yourself. So I troll the websites for a week until I finally found one. Have you looked so at the I'm side effects and is there a specific brand of the vaccine that you would prefer? Uh, I'm like not, you know, Johnson and I'm, Johnson, Moderna. I'm going to do the Johnson and Johnson just because I don't want to have to do it too. One shot. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and I read the study, uh, about the efficacy of it, you know, uh, and I believe that I thought the number of efficacy of the Johnson and Johnson is lower it's true that it was tested on a different time than the Pfizer and the Moderna. Mm -hmm. So somebody was explaining that uh, like if you had to test the Moderna and the Pfizer at the same time where Johnson & Johnson was tested, their number could have been different too. Okay. Uh, the important thing is that uh, it's 100% uh, productive to have any of them because all of them protect you from going to the hospital and dying. Yeah. And they, they, those numbers are the same for all of them. 
even the Chinese one, there has an efficacy of only 50%. When it comes to, does it prevent to go to the hospital? Does it prevent to die? They're also all above 90%. So I thought like, you know, if I can choose one and this website that I found through UCI actually allows you to choose which one you want, I'm just going to go for Johnson & Johnson just because it's more practical for me. Uh, because we also, as pilots, we had to take two days off after the vaccine. And with my schedule, it's kind of hard to predict when and how yeah. that will happen. Mm -hmm. So if I can really get this on Monday, I will let you know on Monday if it's really going to do, they're going to do what they promised to do, to give me the one that I choose. Are you going to uh, be back in, in the Jesus States? Month. Are you going to be back home? Yeah, and I'm going to be the back States on, on Saturday. Monday. So Monday is perfect. I'm, I'm like, actually, uh, there were a lot of appointments available at UCI. And uh, I, I choose Monday so that I, you know, I enjoy the weekend since I've been working. Plus, I want to be there rested i don't want to get that already tired and jet lagged you know yeah because uh, they say there's a lot of um symptoms of fatigue right right so i want to see how it goes uh, some of my colleagues have gone it and uh, the j and j only giving them like sore arm. yeah that's so, the injection so, site um yeah, I've I've so kind of weighed out the one the uh vaccines that are available here in the u.s and if i eventually get one i'm gonna do the j and j one as well I also the j and j is the mo most traditional one mm -hmm. the way it's produced is like the old-fashioned way of making vaccines basically it's the vector with you know it is a flu virus that has been modified genetically to carry wherever information is to carry it. um so I mean, it's not that much different, I would think. I mean, I'm not an expert. Then getting the regular flu shot that you get every year, uh, risk-wise. You know, they didn't use any special new technology like Pfizer or, or the other one. Uh, the Moderna one, that the reason why I personally don't like it, besides the two shots, like my girlfriend is a teacher in Irvine, they're going to be going to school in the school in small pods mm. soon instead of just Zoom classes. Yeah, yeah. She had to drive all the way to Carlsbad twice to get right, Moderna right. one and the Moderna And then the second shot. time, you really feel sick, I heard. The second time, yeah. you get 24 hours, you really feel bad. I think she felt bad for about three days. I oh, think it lasted think? even longer for her. So I, I'm hoping that, that this is just going to be one and done. And, one and, and done. Then. Yeah. Um, also but, with the Moderna, they have to keep it at such uh, low freezing temperatures. Right. In my opinion, I think there is too many ways More that that could get screwed up. Like if it's right, 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 right. not, if it's, if this box wasn't, put in the right temperature refrigerator in time and the temperature uh, was raised yeah what happens to the vaccine have, does it get modified is it not that. as effective is it oh. then almost like poison being put in your body or the vaccine with the j and j it seems more stable it doesn't have to be at yeah. a specific temperature it's one yeah shot. because it's like the old-fashioned one it's like it's just your regular shots I mean, it's basically, if I understand correctly, it's, it's produced similarly with the regular vaccine that we take all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I choose that one. Hopefully they give me that one and uh, that will be it. Uh, yeah. Big debate out there. You know, I, I, can, I was having this conversation with a friend not too long ago. Um, people that have doubts about it and all oh, they're absolutely against it and all those theory about people trying to control you or pharma wants to harm you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I, you know, if you eat a McDonald's and you've done <laughs> drugs, smart pot and throughout your life, that is bigger problems <laughs> you had to do with in the shot. Number one. I'm addicted on codeine, you know, or Vicodin two, or whatever. Exactly. I'm not getting the vaccine. <laughs> yeah. Number two, 
I 100% agree with the fact that nobody should be forced. Yeah. It's your body, your choice. But it's also my body, my choice to mm -hmm. say, I don't want to be next to you if you don't take the vaccine. True. I was trying to explain to this friend, you have the right not to take the vaccine. But if the majority of the people decide if to go, if to go flying or if, if to go to another country or if to go to the theater or whatever is happening, like in Israel right now, they have a green uh, app that you have to have on your phone when you get vaccinated. If you don't have that, you cannot go inside any public place, basically. Wow. Okay. So the argument was like, basically, they're forcing us. You have yeah. to. Now, my point is like, more than forcing is an incentive to do what I believe is the right thing to do. If you don't want to do, don't do it. But my point is like the majority has also the right to say like, if you don't get vaccinated, we don't want you next to us. So your freedom not to get vaccinated, hence when my freedom not to get infected starts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a two-way street, right? You had the freedom not to do it. I had the freedom not to want to be next to you. And that should, should have had the argument for me. I mean, like, I mean, I don't see any other way around it. You know, like, yeah, you're right. You don't have to do it. You, I don't want to force you to do it. But yet, know that if the majority of us does it and decide not to, you know, hang out with people that don't want to vaccinate and then you are in the minority and you take your consequences. Well, may and maybe it's you not know, the perfect approach, but that's how I see it. So I'm going to do it. Yeah. And back to the restrictions, you know, I've spent uh, 15 years of my life being an HR and a recruiter. And um, from an HR stand standpoint, there's already some companies that are, um, putting restrictions on whether or not you could come back to work or not if mm. you don't get the vaccine. And right. so, so there's going to be a lot of restrictions on people that that have not received the vaccine. Right. It's, it's going to be like two different sets of people. And I, I think it's inevitable. I mean, like, you either believe in science or not. I mean, there's no way around it. You can't, we can't have it both ways. I mean, it could be true that there's a conspiracy theory coming true and we've all been, you know, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. or it's not. I saw my uncle dying two days, so I believe into it. You know, I know that I don't want to get this disease and I want to go back to my regular life. Yeah. Do I believe in signs and I believe the vaccine could be the solution for it. Uh, I don't want to push my ideas on anybody else. But at the end of the day, the majority has to, you know, kind of direct the rest of the world. And if people wanted to be marginalized for not taking it, so be it. I mean, like, I know the company going to have a lot of problems. It's not going to be easy for HR to force people to take it uh, but they can incentivize them by saying for example for <laughs> us right? you can't come back to work <laughs> that's, as pilots that's they, could like, incentive. they could say like you know for international pilots okay uh if you don't take the vaccine you're not going to be able to go to israel you're not going to be able to go to tel aviv so you're not going to be able to go to sydney you're not going to be able to go to taiwan and so then uh, you've got one route left you're like give it to me <laughs> exactly but you, you can't blame them it's not the company fault i mean if the other country are not going to let you in there's nothing they can do about it if you don't want to take the vaccine yeah or I, you know i talked to a nurse they said like well my uh, uh my hospital told us that if we don't take the vaccine we cannot go to training anymore huh if you don't do training then you do well and then you can't work it's your choice. I mean, it, you, you can just, I'm not saying that it's a nice thing, but the thing is like, at the end of the day, they have to figure out a way how to kind of standardize all of this. Because yeah. it's also not fair that we risk taking the vaccine and then they're going to take the advantage of the 
improved situation when the virus disappears and they don't have to worry about it anymore. Mm. I mean, this has to be something that has to be shared by the whole community, not just the people that are the guinea pig taking the vaccine. Mm. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so if you have some medical reason that makes you really uh, uh, at risk, Okay, now, you know, you skip it. You wait for the herd immunity and we take the hit for you. But if you are a healthy person and you only have some conspiracy theory behind it for the reason that like, you don't want to take the thing, mm -hmm. then I'm not good with it because I'm, I'm not going to do this sacrifice just for you to enjoy when everything goes away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, we all have to participate the same way. Yeah. How about that doctor in Florida? He passed away after getting a Moderna shot. I believe it was Moderna. Yeah. <clears throat> I think so. there was a second doctor as well. And um, people are that, you know, they, they were the first ones to get the shots because they're the frontline workers. So right. the news is finally reporting on some of the um, side effects that these people have had. Uh, like one doctor after he had it, his whole arm went numb for the day. Like he couldn't mm -hmm. use it. It was numb. And yeah. there, there's a, there's some side effects that happen to just a, a few people, you know, and, and unfortunately like it, it is, you don't know if you're going to be the unlucky one that gets those side effects. Right. And it, it is a sacrifice that we're doing by taking it. And it's not fair for the other people to say like, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm just going to wait for you to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Because the only way to fix the problem is herd immunity, either through vaccination or infection. And so, uh, I mean, I think everybody should try to do their best. Uh, yeah, I know th there's been a lot of cases with AstraZeneca too in Europe. And it's oh, been yeah? for a while. And then some people, a lot of, not a lot, but there's like a few cases of uh, people in armed force in Italy that died almost immediately after they took the vaccine. But uh, so far, the investigation has said, like, this is also within the margins of regular death. So, in other words, yeah, this guy died the day after he took the vaccine. But there is still no 100% proof or link between his death and the vaccine. He could have got this, they got, like, aneurysm. Yeah. Cloth. They got cloth. He said he could possibly have got the clot the next day anyway, either got the vaccine or not. I mean, there is no link between the two. Now, of course, for the family, it's hard to accept that because he goes in okay and then the next day he's dead. And there was a Navy guy, a two policemen. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a tough choice. It's not easy. But that's how, I, you know, I explained to you before how I made up my mind. I made up my mind because I think this is the best and the quickest way to get out of this. Yeah. Yeah, we have a population of, what, 7.5 billion people on this planet. And this virus is going across the whole globe. You know, we, we can't live in this suspended quarantine, stay in place right. for... Yeah. 10 years you know no, I mean, it's been hard enough this past year and almost a half it's been hard so far our life have been somehow decently normal i mean except for the social part of it but nobody is really stuck to dead or being in the street without food in our countries mm -hmm. because the government has been borrowing money and kind of try to keep everything afloat mm -hmm. But in the long run, this situation is not sustainable. And then the no. shows in the country that I don't have the power to borrow money, they're already desperate. Mm -hmm. Central South America countries, there's people starving in the streets because they don't have a job. Mm -hmm. And then so malaria, they, we yeah, still so haven't figured only, out malaria we'll yet. take a little bit more for that to arrive to us too because we know how many poor people we have even in our rich countries. So eventually this, it's not sustainable. You had to fix it somehow. Yeah. And if this is true, which I believe it is true, 
eventually the only other option is to let people die until you know uh you get immunity like they did in the 1600s with the other pandemics that they had mm -hmm. i mean is that a you know is that the option that you want to go to or you want to try with science and the vaccine? I, I'm, I'm choosing the vaccine. The other people are free to do what they want, but they have to take the responsibility. Yeah. If they're going to be marginalized. They're going to be marginalized. It, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we talked about this for a while. <laughs> we did. It's like nobody can get away from it, no matter where um, you are. So when... Right now, if somebody want, let's say someone's uh, 17, 18, 19 years old, um, they want to go into flight school. Is that even an option right now or is school shut down? No, I think the school is still working. The colleges are open. I mean, they're doing online. So I don't know. Maybe like, uh, I wouldn't imagine. No, I, ever, I have not heard that the flight schools are closed. Uh, but... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they can do it. And uh, this whole thing set back the industry a little bit, but eventually we were in a phase where there was going to be a lot of requests and a big shortage of pilots. In oh, this really? Country. And uh, in fact, the expert is saying that as soon as this is over, it is going to go back to the point where we were before. So this is a great time. And then I have mentored uh, two or three young uh, uh, students through the process and actually one is just graduating from UVU which is University Utah Valley University which is my same college and uh, is finishing his degree and is finishing his uh, licenses uh, there is uh, a quicker path than the one I had right now because uh, a lot of the regional airlines the smaller plane uh, airlines mm -hmm. that fly the domestic routes are going to need a lot of pilots once this is over. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because the major airlines have hired a lot in the last few years, uh, their base has been depleted. So uh, they could skip some of the processes that I had to go through, like flying, instructing for a long time and just go straight to a regional airline for a few years and then be hired by a major airline. Uh, so yeah, this is still a good time to get into aviation for sure. Because um, just around the corner, it will be booming again, right? It will, it will. And because there's a lot of still, you know, a lot of the Vietnam Hera pilot, uh, they were the base of the airline industry at the beginning. They all have reached the age where they have to retire. So there is a big chunk of them in the next few years. It, it already started a couple of years back, um, they, but it's continuing. And now this has actually expedited uh, the process of them retiring because a lot of company, my company included, has offered a lot of incentive for them to retire early. Uh, so Yeah, makes sense. Uh, some of them are living even before they reach 65, because the company basically giving them like incentive to leave basically they pay them a certain amount for the last two three years so once the schedule returns full force we're going to be short hmm. and when we are short we take pilots from the regional airlines and then the regional airlines have to hire again and the the gate backfill limitation are much lower to get into a major into a region airline than the one that you need to have for a major. So it is still a good time. I will still recommend people that like aviation and they wanted to get into it to do it. Yeah. Now they have also experienced what aviation is all about. We are very susceptible of world economy, pandemic, uh, wars spike in oil price and all of that so it's also very honest to tell anybody that if you like the lifestyle and you rather be flying around the world than going to the office every day this is a good place for you but be prepared 
to have in a certain way exciting and unstable career sometimes things can go great and you reach the place that you want to be quick but then maybe it could be taken away from because even i was almost to the age of being losing my job a few months ago mm. uh, because if you made redundant you will lose your job but the good thing is that your prof training and profession profession is one that is going to be needed for the foreseeable future and uh, it's not easy to train people from scratch quickly so if you have rich certain level of experience then you're marketable let's say if you know going to find a job i mean except for this case which was worldwide right but normally if you were to lose a job in america and you couldn't find another job here in the united states most likely you could have temporarily go somewhere else and got hired almost right away because how the countries have much harder time training pilots the united states has oh really we're we're good at it <laughs> well because we have a bigger industry so we produce a lot more we have a lot more colleges a lot of more flight schools we have a lot of more general aviation so the small planes is the base for every pilot to begin right and most of the rest of the world the general aviation it's almost non existent you know when you go to orange county and you see all those little private plane parked yeah be as many as the old italy general aviation in one airport in america oh wow so and so for example here in japan it's almost impossible to have your own little airplane and fly around mm. too many barriers too many rules too many too expensive to do it so almost nobody does that that's why american is always and we were the one that invented you know flying so we are way ahead so the arabs the chinese even south america it's always behind they always need pilots in normal times um so I still recommend the profession for the lifestyle and for the fact that you're not going to an office every yeah. day you meet new people your colleagues are though are a group that you may know may not you know you could possibly go for months to work and meet new people every time you go is you know we we rarely fly with each other again huh trip after trip we always find new people every time we go to work okay so you may end up flying with somebody you know eventually more often because you are at the same seniority level or you like the same destinations or what not but generically you could fly with somebody and then don't see him for a month and two months three months and fly with so many other people on the way so mm -hmm. if if you like that it's definitely a profession for you it takes you know uh i said a lot of planning and uh some studying and hard work at the beginning and it's not very glamorous at the beginning because you fly small planes or you may have to pay for it you know the the training is expensive but eventually you get into something that almost doesn't even feel like work i mean to me honestly like Yes, I'm tired for the jet lags and flying long hours in it. But it's so much of what I want to do that very rarely I go to work and really? I feel like bless you. And I feel like burdened by it. Sometimes, you know, if you're missing an event at home or something like that, but then it could be heavy living. But in general, when I go to work, I go to work happy. <laughs> which is very important in life. Yeah, it is. I spent yeah. over 15 years working in an office being a recruiter and I've had to try to prioritize what I want the next stage of my life to be because I'm sick of going into an office and working at a cube with a computer and I want more freedom. That's partly why I've um started this channel. And I have another channel as well. So 
I'm just trying to reinvent myself so I don't have to go back to the corporate world and live under the fluorescent lights and, you know, be looking at the clock, you know, Can't what, wait to finish, what yeah. time is it? You know, do I you, get out you, of here yet? You surprise how many pilots <laughs> are almost desperate when they come to the age that they have to retire. And some they won't. Some they, they can do other things. You can fly corporate. You can, they continue to fly because it's just a lifestyle. It's not just a job. Do you it's think you'd a, ever be a private, flying a private jet? Do you think when you I, retire you know, or go to the I started day? very early, very early. I mean, I've been, I'm on, I'm 43 and I've been doing this for four, 23 years already. I got 22 more to go. I think when I'm done, I'm going to be done. You know, we want to retire, go back to Italy, get a villa or something. Like, I don't want to work until I drop. It's just not how I was raised and my culture is different. Like, we Oh, work. yeah. I do a lot of my job, but I think another 22 of this, 22, 23 years of this is going to be enough. Plus, be I can ready. <laughs> still continue to travel. Yeah. Because we have great benefits, and even when you retire, you can you continue to have the benefits of free traveling with mm -hmm. the company you work for. So, uh, yeah, I think when it's time to retire, I will retire. But it's very difficult for people to let it go because in this profession, the seniority gives you so much flexibility, and it gives you the best paying job. And so when you get to the point where you're close to retiring, most likely you are a captain in a big plane, you work very little and make a lot of money. And when you go to work, you go somewhere that you like because you basically, based on seniority, can choose exactly when and where you want to go. Yeah. So imagine if your job is to go two times a month to Sydney. And then that's taken away from you. You're like, oh. I need yeah. my Sydney fix. It's not something you <laughs> necessarily gonna despise, you know, like, oh my God, I can't wait to get out of this. Yeah. And then at the seniority level, if you one month don't feel like doing it, you can always put the trip to, you know, we have boards where you can post the trip and somebody can fly for you. Oh, well, that's nice. So that's why pilots at that, at that level, they just have a hard time to live, which is a good thing. That should be inspiring for people knowing that after sacrifice is done when you're young, you know, at the beginning where life is not that easy and you don't make that much money. But if you progress in your career, eventually the job is going to become much more enjoyable and much uh, easier and uh and you're gonna love it <laughs> sounds yeah. like you're gonna love it and hate to leave it yeah. right yeah that's the proof the proof to me that we do a job that we like is the fact that people don't want to leave yeah very few people say like oh yeah i can't wait to leave yeah especially in the type of flying that i'm doing now maybe the guys that do the domestic flying it's a lot harder there's a lot more work right because they do a lot of short flights and, uh, so maybe they and then they've been they go to the same place over and over again that they've seen for thirty years. They're probably mm. tired of it. But me, for now, in this fleet that I'm flying, this is the plane that is you know opening all the new markets. So I'm flying the Boeing seven eighty seven Dreamliner for you oh, yeah. for the other company around the world. This is the new the market opener for all the places, new places that we go. So, like, before COVID hit, we had so many new destinations that were going to happen. Mm. And uh, they were canceled, but they were just, they just put, put aside for now. But eventually... Just on hold. It's just yeah, on hold, just right? Yeah, And so, to me, it's exciting. I mean, a lot of people may think it's crazy to be one of the go around the world all, all week and every week. But that's what I like to do. Yeah. Well, that's what this channel is basically supposed to do. Show people's exciting careers and inspiration and motivation and, yeah. you know, and, and also 
talk about, you know, how we're all getting through this, through this pandemic. But when the pandemic's over, hopefully my channel will still be going and we'll be talking about mm -hmm. other things. But still, um, you know, careers to me are very interesting. And you picked a really, really good one. And I love seeing your photos. They are just, <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm jealous yeah. of all the food pictures and you're at the beach all the time or <laughs> this, you love the beach, this year right? has mostly been about food because a lot of places we can't do anything else other than eat yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i have so many food pictures just now i went to have lunch and uh, try this amazing beef from japan that was so good oh i'm jealous i'm so yeah. jealous i'm a foodie on the side so when i watch or when I see your what you're eating, I'm like, oh, I went it's to Santa Barbara. There's also, there's also a lot of guys that just stick with their basics. Yeah. You go look for hamburgers even on top of the wall. And I'm uh, like, oh, my God. Why? Why? We are, I don't know, in Korea, wherever, and you are looking for fried chicken. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> try something different. And they're like, nope. I like it. I don't want to try it. Forget about it. And I'm like, okay. Then you go by yourself. <laughs> uh, what's the strangest thing you've ever eaten? Uh, I, I wouldn't say, like, I'm not really that crazy, okay? I try a lot of new things, but still within the range of, like, what makes me comfortable. I mean, like, strange animals, not so much. But... um. In China, I had this uh, almost like a pate that was okay. made of donkey meat. Donkey? Yeah. Oh, jeez. Wow. And it was covered with chili and stuff. And then huh. uh, probably I had many other things in China that I have no idea what that were inside the soups. <laughs> yeah. Who knows what's in that? The mystery soup. Um, I had sea urchin this past uh, weekend. I went to Santa Barbara, and they brought the sea urchin. It, they had just cut it and served a sea oh. urchin on scallop on a little lemon, oh. and the spines were still moving. Yeah, yeah, still it moving. was that fresh. The sea, for some, then it's all cultural, right? Because to me, sea urchin is absolutely familiar. I've been eating since I was a kid because we eat it in Italy all the time. We make pasta with it. We hit it with bread and stuff. And uh, so it's other things like horse meat or, you know, donkey meat. It's not that different. <laughs> but it's our culture. Like, you know, lobster yeah. used to be. It used to be given to. Slaves and to criminals the, in jail. And, if yeah. I remember the article I well, read. Originally to the slave, they said, when they arrived in the States, you know, in the northern states. When okay. they arrived, the first colonials, it was such a horrible thing to look at that people thought was like cockroaches. And they just gave it to the prisoners and the display. And now it's the most expensive food you can find. And so is caviar. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just a different type of fish egg. But we throw away most of the fish eggs that we, you know, you normally never see in a market fish eggs because they've been thrown away. But that specific fish, we liked it, and uh, somebody decided that it's, uh, you know, within a reason. You know, like when it comes to bugs and things like that, it just it grosses me. Yeah, I see seen them like, and I can't. Um, like a roach on a stick and it's deep fried. I, I don't think I would try that. I mean, I might try one. In Southeast Asia, I've seen that. I've seen the scorpions. I ate the scorpions. Kids. In Santa Monica, I had scorpions yeah. on a piece of bread with some cheese, and it was a little scorpion, mm. and me and this girl, we split it. We both ate it, so we're okay. scorpion eaters. But in the bread and stuff, so it's a little bit better. I probably yeah. would like that, too. But So well, mostly in the middle of China, I've seen some weird stuff that I wouldn't try. Some don't even necessarily is a bug or anything like that. It's just the texture. Yeah. Uh, there's some noodles that are made out of some jello stuff. Or 
Yeah, I'm there's that food, jelly yeah. food. I'm not really they into that. Weird colors like black or like this just I'm not gonna go for it. I mean, if I gotta eat something, I gotta enjoy it. I don't wanna eat something that I don't like. Well, I like when I cook, I like putting everything on a nice plate. So it's not just about the food, it's also about the presentation. Too, the colors too, right? That's why those noodles turn me off because they're like black. They look weird. I just those are the squid ones made with the squid ink, I think. No, no. That, that, you know, my mother makes an amazing squid ink, but that's why I'm saying it's all cultural, right? It, okay. it, in that case, it's the color mixed with the texture. So yeah. all of a sudden, it looks like you're dipping into a, you know, in a box of gelatin that you would use to put it in the car you know, gears on Sunday. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Some kind of lubricant, huh? Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> they, they love it. They love it, you know. Mm. Uh, we got our burgers here in America. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everyone loves them. good food in America, too. Most the other day, I was in Atlanta after a long time. I haven't done, like, a domestic layover, and as soon as we land in Atlanta, almost all of us in Indonesian said, like, we want barbecue. <laughs> so we went to find an amazing barbecue in Atlanta because we never get to eat that around, you know? Yeah. And Texas, I heard there's some places in Texas that have really good barbecue. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I know that one. You know, we were in Texas for, for years. You know, Shannon's mm -hmm. from Texas. I lived there for five years and yeah. And Atlanta oh. barbecue is very similar to the Texan barbecue. It's okay. really good. It's really good. Well, I'm yeah. jealous. Scorpions for sure. <laughs> well, I am so glad that you were able to set up this interview with me and the Zoom call. Thank you so much for joining yeah. me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Got Open, to learn a lot about. Somebody. Yeah, I and think you have. Yeah. And of course, you have a fabulous life and a fabulous family. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm thank sure you. I'll see you at another time. And we, <laughs> we need to stop partying again. I think this is our. Yeah. You make some fabulous pasta. This, guy, my makes the, this guy makes the real stuff, the real <laughs> Italian stuff. Yeah. None of this. Uh, what is it? Macaro macaroni grill or oh, olive dear. garden. Oof, no, I won't even no. go there. I grew up with an Italian grandma and Italian mom and watching them cook in the, in the kitchen and pulling me in to make this or that, or help them with the cannolis. And, <laughs> oh you know? and they don't, and they don't cook with recipes and cookbooks. No. They're just like, Oh, little bit of this little bit of that they've been cooking so long they just know how to do it and that's how yeah. you cook. i loved watching you cook at that dinner party we should have one soon yeah because we all get our shot we can go up for it and then maybe we would do like a vaccine party yeah Keep some people <laughs> off <laughs> just... all right well Okay, well, let's wrap up the interview, but stay on, stay on with me before we hang up. But, um, but yeah, I wanted to thank you for being here all the way from Japan. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> through to do the it Zoom call. Me. And, um, and thank you so much. I hope you've inspired a lot of people. I know I've been inspired and it's really awesome that you're flying the new planes and you're really excited about the new plane yeah. and uh, the model. And, and the expansion that you guys have in the future, I mean, that's going to really um, keep the airline industry going and yeah. have everybody get to fly around and visit people. I can't wait to see my new uh, great-nephew in Honolulu, Hawaii, once these oh. restrictions go down. I need to go see my, see my little... Yeah, I need to go see little bambino. I, my sister had a baby, too. Yeah. I haven't been able to see it. So. Yeah. Well, here's the living, right? Yeah, We're making absolutely. through. We're making through. Well, thank you so much for flying all of our Amazon boxes around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder what we find. Sometimes we don't even know. <laughs> tigers, lions, tigers, bears, maybe. No, just kidding. 
Okay. Well, everybody out there, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for spending some time with me and Alfonso. And we will see you another time on Next Mill in with Shell. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.